Senator Niemeyer and Senator Italian because they were the four conferees on House Bill 1144, which Senator Schlager was the author. I'm sorry. <laughs> Representative Schlager. Don't, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and um, it's such an exciting time to be at the railroad today with everything that's happening. And we're very in, uh, excited about what took place in the General Assembly and all the hard work and bipartisan support that, that were reflected in what these two uh, fine examples of, of government servants did for the region. And Bill Hanna is going to talk a little bit about what the impacts of 1144 can do for the region. I just thought it'd be great for the board to hear from them today about the process and how excited they are for what the future of this region can be. We so yes, if you could come up here and you can face the audience or anything else. That way you can. Don't worry about turning around on that. <laughs> Okay, I'll start. We, uh, we started this bill, just real quickly, what took place, as a placeholder. We knew we needed to do something, and we didn't know exactly where that was going to go and how we were going to get it through the, the General Assembly, because another $6 million a year was probably unlikely. Uh, but that was what we were shooting for. Uh, you, you may remember last year we got $6 million for the Westlake uh, extension. And so um, all the road funding really kind of created uh, an environment where economic development was a priority and this kind of uh, dovetailed into it. But what we needed to do was create a mechanism where we could say to the other 99 legislators, uh, and, and that the people uh, who represent the people of Indiana, that in fact we have an opportunity to provide a really good return on investment to the people of Indiana. And that's what 1144 was really doing, kind of outlining what those uh, benefits would be uh, in, in specific terms. And then we found out, as, as the bill evolved, that, uh, that we needed to establish the funding mechanism between four different counties. And I would be willing to tell you that, that trying to get uh, four different counties to agree that the sun would come up in the morning <laughs> is a difficult task. And, uh, and, and we managed to get this done. Uh, and, and so we dealt with, with the possibility of underage and overage uh, on costs and payments because we have estimates and although we have good contingencies built into those estimates you never know what comes along. So the bill became very encompassing to accomplish all of these tasks and uh, I was really appreciative. Uh, Representative Pilath uh, was very helpful. Um, we had numerous meetings where, where we talked about how we were going to bring people together and uh, he did his thing. I did mine, and uh, hey, the party came together. Go ahead. Oh, thank, thanks, Hal. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be over here with you, and it's nice to have the chance to come back from Indianapolis and be able to talk about good things. 
Um, <laughs> because uh, too often we talk about things that we wish we could have done or things maybe we could have done better. And I think uh, this is unambiguously positive for our region. I want to give a special thanks to Representative Slager for his leadership and also Bill Hanna here. I mean, I, I really enjoyed um, everyone having the opportunity to work together on something of such broad economic development importance. I think that a couple of uh, great successes. One was that uh, everyone worked so well together in a very bipartisan, candidly nonpartisan <coughs> fashion. It was really for the good of people back home. Uh, secondly, we, we, we started with something that we were pretty sure was going to, at a minimum, be a two-county project, and really did the hard work to make it a four-county project. And when you're talking about being able to go from Michigan City to Millennium Park in an hour, one day, expanding more of the region into the, uh, the, the commuter transportation area of this broad interstate economic region, uh, being able to get to the South Bend Airport uh, and, and maybe have that be a, a, a primary place of uh, intermodal transportation, that's, that's something that's going to allow us to grow and it's going to cut down on the cost of time, which means more people are going to be able to live in our region, they're going to be able to work in our region, and they're going to be able to maybe work in a broader area and come back here to lay their head down at night. And that is a, that has intrinsic value because if, if you know I think about my kids that are going to be uh, uh, you know in the workforce here pretty shortly, uh, I dream of them staying here and prospering alongside of us. And things like the South Shore development are, are are a large part of what's going to make that type of thing possible for everyone. So again, my my special gratitude to the. Uh, the, the, the gentleman here with me, and particularly to the board, and also to you, and also to you, Mike, and to John. Your your leadership and communications were uh, 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 superb. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, I want to especially thank the board. I, I just um, and congratulate you, uh, not only for today's accomplishment, but for uh, just running a stellar organization. It's, it's one thing to go and try to talk about ideas and speculation. It's another to build them off of something that's solid and tested and trusted and true uh, and valuable. And in my opinion, you've taken your rightful seat as the leaders of the economic development efforts for Northwest Indiana and the four counties. Uh, and so thank you for all the work you've done over the years uh, to get us to this point. Um, I also just as you know, public servant and uh, not an elected official. Uh, so my job is to try to help build these things, and um, you know, I really feel strongly that um, the mark of a good public servant is to not reserve any ideas for self-interest or gain at a future time, but to put everything you can bring creative, uh, in terms of your creativity uh, and implementation onto the table today for the equity of the public. And Mike Nolan is certainly uh, one of those guys, and a key partner and a tremendous partner in this, an unbelievable, uh, uh, excellent and timely hire. Uh, for the South Shore train, um, couldn't have uh, done it uh, without him. Uh, but I also just want to uh, let you know too that uh, what I observed as sort of the third party in the mix there was uh, some people think unprecedented. I don't think so for these two gentlemen. Uh, there never was a time where jobs weren't the most important thing, the four counties weren't the most important thing. It was about how we get it done. And as they say, iron sharpens iron. And in the conversation, we saw that, and what we ended up with was a much more comprehensive, top to bottom, thoughtful uh, outcome than I think we had originally ever hoped for, uh, which included 1144. Uh, 1144 makes this project, in my mind, unique, and hopefully positions us much better in Washington to receive federal funds in the sense that it really emphasizes the economic development aspects of the Navy South Shore system. Uh, go back to 2015 in Westlake, and now this huge victory. Uh, leading the state in economic development through this great facility is where this has put us. Um, we now have a tool in the wall, 1144 simply does, is it allows us to collect increments uh, uh, as communities within those footprints, use them within the area they're collected uh, to be able to bond against them, uh, and to bring in new business and new investment uh, to do accelerated growth around the train, and not only helps the community, but also complements uh, the ridership and sustainability of the South Shore system. So I, I would tell you this is nothing short of a paradigm <coughs> shift too for uh, your organization as really a key strategic piece of the state's overall view on how it does interstate commerce and how it fits into Chicago and how all communities benefit from uh, everything that we've done over the years. So again, and I just so I, I 
I wish I could tell you about the intimate conversations that went on and how transparent and thoughtful uh, the, the, these uh, two gentlemen really were and how proud uh, as a Northwest Indiana born and bred native uh, to have our minority leader come here, member of Ways and Means, and at all of these different levels, committee levels, and the governor's office or wherever else, you'll find a Northwest Indiana person in there fighting as hard as they can for the region. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for everything you've done. I'd like to say that 40, uh, when, when the railroad started, the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. And you know what happened after <laughs> that is our milestone of, of events. But 40 years ago, which uh, Mr. Parson brought up today, um, we got that together and helped save this railroad. Because that was a bipartisan across the board. We put the four counties together to, create, to keep this railroad as it is today. So 40 years ago, we succeeded. Today, we're doing the same thing. And I appreciate the help from the House of Reps and Senators. Well, ho hopefully we won't have to wait 108 years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. existing sidewalk across your rail line and replace it with a wider bicycle path, <clears throat> plus pedestrian bicycle crossing gates and other safety improvements. This project has long been supported by a large number of organizations and local governments, including our local council of mayors, the South Suburban Mayors and Managers Conference, and the Illinois Department of Transportation. The project overall involves the construction of 1.3 miles of trail which represents the last unresolved gap in a 12-mile trail corridor known as the Burnham Greenway and Pensy Greenway. This regional trail began over 20 years ago when Open Lands, my employer, acquired an abandoned Conrail rail corridor and parceled it off for trail construction to the Chicago Park District, to the Forest Preserves of Cook County, the Land Oak Park District, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and the Kelly Mount Memorial Park District. The Land Oak Park District, a few years later, extended the trail uh, to the Indiana border. And from that point, it's going to extend another 11 miles from Munster through Munster to Crown Point, Indiana. The Illinois Department of Natural Resources is planning by next year to extend this portion of the trail along Brainerd Avenue to Vernon Avenue, directly across the street from your rail tracks. It is a well-used trail providing non-motorized transportation links to local jobs, commerce, community facilities. The Secretary of the Illinois Department of Transportation has written a letter of support for the project as designed. And we've worked closely with Commonwealth Edison, who will gain a critical second access to a large transformer facility by using this trail. Several years ago, the Vernon Avenue Bridge was declared structurally deficient and for a pretty long period of time, ComEd could not even access its facility through its existing single entrance. This trail <coughs> can solve that problem, so it doesn't happen yet. The trail project is currently under review by the Illinois Commerce Commission, where hearings 
Nickley and South Shore Railroad have opposed this project, demanding what could prove to be a, a six to ten million dollar trail bridge to be built over your tracks. The village has for the past year <coughs> expressed support for pursuing such a bridge project as a separate proposal and in collaboration with the railroads. <coughs> the village's offer has not been acceptable to Nikki and South Shore Railroad. So we're now in the third year of these hearings and at a point in which the judge has agreed to send us to an evidentiary hearing, which is basically a court proceeding in which she will render a judgment. Your rationale for opposing the village project has been stated to be based on safety concerns. Your agency's comments over the past few years have ranged over the following several points. Number one, remove the existing sidewalk. Don't let people cross the tracks anymore. <clears throat> this suggestion would force residents of an entire village neighborhood to walk in the car lanes of Burnham Avenue in order to access restaurant shopping in your own Hedwish South Shore Station. I was out on the site with your engineers when that was suggested. Both the Illinois Department of Transportation and the Illinois Commerce Commission staff have expressed opposition to the removal of this sidewalk, this pedestrian passage, even in the future of the pedestrian bicycle bridge is built. Uh, another point you try to make is just don't build the fi final one mile trail segment of this 12 mile corridor because more people will use it. This comment ignores the fact that this is the only available crossing of your tracks that's in line with 11 miles of already built or funded sorry, trail. I, I, sorry, I, I'd like to get to we that. Three, we have three minutes, so you can keep the three minutes. Okay, I, I, I didn't know that before I started, so I'll try to read as quick as I can. Give me a conclusion real quick, please. Uh, third point was build a great separated bridge, and they take five to six years. In all these situations, that safety improvements are not going to be installed, you are going to be at risk. Uh, and so I would make the point that if a bicyclist or pedestrian had been hurt or killed in the last three years of these ICC hearings, how would your agency explain its record in opposing the village's project and safety improvements? If your agency delays the project until a new pedestrian bicycle bridge is built and no safety improvements are installed during that time period, which is at least five to six years, adds additional time that you're going to be at risk. How would you explain that to like somebody who were hurt killed? I'm down to the last part. Okay. After three years of opposition and ICC hearings, based on what we uh, covered in terms of fundraising for the village, I would estimate your agency to spend significant legal costs, possibly in the $100,000 range. In a court case, if you proceed on it, could double that expenditure. If you were to win in court, the result is no project, no safety improvements. Again, how would you explain that? I would recommend that you unconditionally support the village's proposed effort safety improvements and instead spend the dollars that you're on the verge of committing for a court case and put it in the phase one engineering so we can move forward on designing the bridge and put your money to more productive use. Okay, sir. Thank you. And I'll pass up comments. Okay, any other public comment this time? Any other public comment? Public comment is closed. Mr. Chairman, and I'll briefly comment on that. We are in a proceeding, and, and we're before the Illinois Com Commerce Commission, who has jurisdiction over this issue, and the parties do get to present their points of view. As we've said in the past, we are not opposed to trade. Uh, we want to see it done in a safe <coughs> way. When this, when this project was originally um, designed, they decided to put a bridge over one set of railroad tracks, but not ours. Uh, the, the best way to eliminate uh, safety issues is to separate uh, pedestrians and bikes from the, rail train, uh, the railroad. And this is not a typical crossing. It is not a perpendicular crossing. It's a crossing that is at an acute angle that's, that not only services our tracks, but also services the CSX and NS trains, who, by the way, are also opposing this position. So it's not simply uh, South Shore Freight and, and, and NICD that have concerns about this area. We would love to see an enhanced solution. However, before we think, before we invite significant more traffic to this, it's a lightly traveled area today, but the whole purpose is here, and we support trails. 
is to bring more people to the area. So before we do that, we want to see it done in the safest possible fashion, and that has been our position for the ICC. And the board is taking the Hey, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, um, what, what I would start, what start up is a legislative update. We had uh, uh, the start here, with, which was the big uh, news out of the, this last session in the General Assembly. Uh, let's let's kind of go back here uh, in the way that machine a little bit. Uh, 2014, the board passed the strategic plan, the 20-year plan. Three of the key components in it were the Westlake project, double tracking the South Shore, and relocating. Uh, the South Bend Airport from the east side to the west side. We have fast forward to today, and we are on the verge of making all three of those things happen. Uh, we got Westlake done in 2015. In 20, uh, late 2015, we went after regional cities' monies to double track the railroad in a smaller segment. We didn't get it, but we got a tremendous amount of positive public relations understanding of what double tracking the railroad could be. Uh, we went, we uh, tried to get money for the study in the, in the non-budget cycle. We weren't successful, but this board decided, you know what, we're going to take a leap of faith and we're going to go after it and we're going to start to do the engineering and environmental uh, for that project. And we started that last April. Uh, Bill Hannon and I took a helicopter ride. And some of these things you look at in your marketing time. We invited the speaker and the uh, chairman Brown from appropriations, or uh, ways and means rather, up in a helicopter ride to show them the region because we all know how beautiful it is and how connected we are to Chicago, but if you're not from the area, you might not see it. And when Bill and I got off that helicopter ride, the two of them looked over at us and said, how do we get this funded? How do we fund double tracking the South Shore? From the moment the session started to the moment the session ended after Governor Holcomb made it part of his <coughs> administrative priorities to fund the double tracking of the South Shore, how remarkable is that to be, have the governor of the state leading a, a, the charge on this and putting it in his budget? It was never if double tracking was going to happen, it was how. How are we going to get it done? How are we going to get it funded? So the entire session was spent on figuring out what's the mechanism to, to, to bring state money, which was successful in House Bill uh, uh, 1001, the budget's got $6 million a year for 30 years, the state's share of this project. And then in 1144, puts together the mechanism for the four counties to come up with the other half of that share so that we can get this project to the federal government in September for a project rate. And uh, as we sit here today, we are well poised on both Westlake and the double tracking of the South Shore to, to bring these projects to the federal government for a rating this fall. So from, from a legislative standpoint, from the state standpoint, it's been a phenomenal couple of years. Uh, great partners with Mr. Hanna, with our state dele with the delegation. When, when I got here, people said, hey, people in North, this Northwest Indiana region, we're dysfunctional. And I have to tell you, all I've seen is the opposite, is function. And, and I said it when we passed Westlake, when we got together as a unified voice, incredibly strong. The House Bill 1144 passed the chambers, in both chambers, 145 of the progress. It is a remarkable support for a regional project because, the, 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 as Representative Slater said, the constituencies across the state understand that if Northwest Indiana is stronger and we bring more income back, it all goes into the state treasury <coughs> and there's more money there for everyone and we all grow. So, um, from a from a state legislative standpoint, it's been a remarkable uh, period of time. And, uh, uh, I think we're well positioned to take the next leg of the process. And I want to talk about that a little bit. We all know that President Trump in the skinny budget cut funding for these for the Westlake and the double track kind of programs. But we all have to remember that a president's budget is a suggestion. Congress passes the budget. And when Congress passed the continuing resolution here, about a week ago, not only did they fund the recommended amount for these kind of projects, which was $2.38 billion, they threw in another $100 million just for good course, and they passed $2.48 billion. That's because these programs have widespread bipartisan support. They just didn't get into the FAST Act because it, it, it sweeped by. There are places all across the country, Texas, um, uh, in California, New York, in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, in Illinois, the bipartisan all a project all across the country, Utah, who want to see these kind of programs continue. So, 
when we go, when the president submits his 2018 budget proposal, I would expect you might not see this kind of program in there. But the good news is we have tremendous bipartisan support in Congress. We've got an Indiana delegation that is laser focused on bringing these projects to the table. You add the economic piece that Bill talked about just a few minutes ago with the transit-oriented development opportunities along, which kind of separates our projects from others around the country. And you add the fact that we have the Vice President of the United States who passed the Westlake project and was a supporter of regional cities. Luke Kenley in the Senate, when they were discussing regional cities uh, funds for the coming uh, uh, budget two-year cycle, said, yeah, we passed money for regional cities. We gave South Shore Railroad $6 million a year. It's probably the biggest regional cities project this state could ever have. So um, we're well positioned to take that next step to get to the federal government, to get our projects rated. And there's certainly going to be a lot of effort to get through the federal side of this, but we're well positioned from a state side. So uh, that's sort of my legislative update on the I want to give you a, a flavor for everything. It's been a very busy. We got the flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Trustee. <laughs> um, the, the, the next thing that we'd like to talk about is the Westlake project specifically. Um, up on the screen, you see the uh, Westlake project quarter map. In the past, you've seen multiple different <coughs> and routes. Last December, this board was asked to pass a locally preferred alternative as we finished the, dra the draft environmental impact statement and we were heading into the public hearing and public comment session. And so what you did was you passed the <coughs> locally preferred alternative subject to listening to the comments that came out of these hearings. And the board's been provided with the hundreds of comments that came out of those uh, public hearings and opportunities for people to communicate their thoughts on the project. In addition to that, we've had additional commentary from our communities. And before you today is a recommendation um, to uh, once again adopt what we call the Hammond Alternative Option 2, uh, which will henceforth be just be called the locally preferred alternative, um, and, and to ratify that decision subject to several different changes that um, we have proposed to add to the alternative based upon the input we received. So we'll start with the, where am I here, John? I'm in, I'm in North Hammond. What you see here is a basic rendering showing that, we, that the parking now is completely on the south side of the track alignment. That's, this is fairly close to what the locally preferred alternative was in December. John, I don't recall, there's no, nothing significant uh, in, in this aspect. The, the next slide, yeah, that's it. There we go. Uh, the next slide is 173rd Street. The, the, the communication we received from Hammond on this was that the community would like to see us um, shift our parking campus and platform to the south, right here at 173rd Street, and move some of our parking to the area south of 173rd Street. And so we studied that, and uh, we believe we can accommodate that request. It's, uh, we may still have some further refinements, but um, this was the request of, uh, we received a letter from uh, the mayor and from uh, we were in communications with their, uh, with their staff. And, and what we're proposing is that we would split the parking north and south of 173rd, and we'd also have an ingress, egress at 175th Street. So that's a proposed change. The, the next item I want to talk about is the Munster Ridge Road Station. If we had the Munster Ridge Road Station sited south of Ridge Road, and we had it there for probably since um, early 2015, when we went out to the public comment period, um, we received a tremendous amount of commentary from the community around uh, the Ridge Road Station and from Munster, and we participated in um, public meetings, um, meetings <coughs> with staff. We know that the Munster Town Council had a number of workshops and sessions that were extremely well attended by members of their community who were concerned about the location of the station um, and wanted us to consider alternatives. So the Munster Town Council sent us a resolution asking us to shift 
the station location from south of Ridge Road and to the east of the tracks to north of Ridge Road. So as part of this process, we studied that and we determined that we can locate the station to the north of Ridge Road. Well, we ran it down from an engineering standpoint to make sure there were no fatal flaws and we're proposing to move the station to north of Ridge Road and west of Manor um, in, in, a, in a, a parcel of property that Munster acquired a number of years ago. Uh, and so, so that would be uh, in, in, uh, in the spirit of the resolution and the request that received from the town of Munster, that would um, uh, recognize that request. And then finally, um, at, the, at the southern end, this is, um, this is the Munster Dyer Station. This is Main Street right here. This is our parking campus right here. We, had, we originally had a four-track layover yard at the southern end of the line. We received a fair amount of commentary from neighbors and from Dyer about the location of that yard and concerns about having the yard there. So we worked with our engineering team and our operating department and we determined that we could move the layover yard to house that in the, in the maintenance facility in North Hammond, which would then free up this area. It would no longer have the maintenance yard. We still need it for, because we had an issue with where we, where we would site our ADA parking and our kiss and ride location. And we also have a retention, water retention area. So rather than this area um, being a layover yard, it'll now be used for uh, kiss and ride and for the ADA purpose. So I think that is responsive to what the community is requesting. We've also had requests, in, you know, it, it, especially as TOD accelerates, to consider shifting our, our parking campus to the west. And so what we have said here is that we'll remain flexible as we go through the design process and if development were to um, occur, or where it's material and we see it's you know, in the immediate future, we can shift the parking campus to the west to site the site TOD opportunities closer into the station. So uh, we have made a number of uh, modifications to the uh, locally preferred alternative that we passed in December in recognition to the comments that we received from the hearings and from the written comments as well as um, additional uh, comments that we received from uh, the various communities. And the last slide here is the, it is just the layover yard and we, we've cited some additional tracks here to allow for the storage. Uh, so with that, um, Mr. Chairman and Board, um, staff would uh, request that you consider passing the uh, revised locally preferred alternative as uh, recommended. Or <coughs> turn the uh, president's uh, proposal for the pleasure of the board. to the community, but all along they knew what they were going to do. So I'm glad to see that um, we have listened and we're willing to take action on what uh, the residents of the community and their leaders want. Comment? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Chairman, I'm going to let uh, Mr. Parsons walk through this, the next uh, item on the agenda, which is a proposed timetable change. Uh, we, we let the board know the last meeting that we had, a, had looked at our train schedules and want to be more efficient with our utilization of equipment and offer more opportunities for our riders. And so, uh, Mr. Parsons, if you want to take it away. Good morning. Um, what we have, this is, this schedule change primarily affects our yeah, evening rush hour return, returning trains. Um, and those that depart after 5 o'clock. We have a train that departs at 457 and another train that departs at 510 right now. And that 510 train, as you can see, is roughly 72% of capacity on a daily basis. This was measured in April. It's about that, it's going in that same range uh, so far this month in May. Um, we think the problem with that train is it's really too early for the 5 o'clock quits. 
and uh, people are really hoping to get it there. We're, and we believe if we move it deeper in the, uh, after the hour, we'll attract more 5 p.m. quits. And we're, uh, we're also looking, I mean, we're also suggesting that the 528 move to 530, again, catching some of the early 530 quits, as well as, again, spreading the load between the new 524 departure and the 5, uh, 530 departure in terms of trying, and we're also going to stop that, uh, I believe we're stopping the 530 train uh, bill. If, is it, we're stopping 530 in Hammond or we're stopping the yes. 520? Yes, that's Yeah, the right. 530 train in Hammond. Again, to try to balance the loads between the 530 train and the 524 departure. Uh, that, and again, those, those are basically the reasons that are driving this. We're also taking what we call the five, that's currently the 532 departure and scheduling that at 545 again to make it more attractive for the 530 quits. And then nothing is happening with the 558 train. So we're really trying to readdress and balance the loads um, on, those, uh, on those later rush hour trains that depart uh, Millennium Station after 5 o'clock. And I would point out, sorry to interrupt, John, but on the 524, it's a 14 minute move, so people's time is important. But we've also eliminated some station stops. So that 524 train is going to express to Hegwish. Uh, and so, whereas in the past, um, the 510 stopped at uh, Museum Campus and it stopped at 57th Street as well. So the net differential in time, I think, is about six minutes. So I don't diminish that. That's a six-minute change. So some people are going to incur a loss of six minutes or a change in their schedule. Other people who couldn't take it before, we've, we've heard this is, a, this is a huge savings for them. So it, schedule changes are never easy. You're always affecting somebody, but people will balance for the schedule. We, uh, we asked for public comment. We posted the notice on the trains. We had it on our website. We asked for passenger comment on, on the changes. And we received 43 emails. You've received those emails. Um, obviously, they, they ranged. But again, the primary concern was 510, the 510 departure. That's why we're putting out this explanation as to why we're, we're changing, changing the 510 train. We believe it'll work. We believe we'll, we'll increase. Uh, occupancy on that train, and that's the objective here, and and also to uh, to improve the occupancy of uh, of the of the later 5:45 train as well, and it should help the 5:30 departure. So well, we have John. We had a gap between 5:32 and yeah. 6, so we now have a train because of the utilization of our equipment. We had a train at 5:10, 5:28, 5:32, and nothing until 5:59. So now we have uh, 5 o'clock. We have 5:24, 5:30, and 5:59. So we've really spaced our offerings out so that we're more, I think we offer more opportunities for our riders as well. And uh, we indicated at our, our March meeting that we come back to report on the findings. And, and that's the nature of today's uh, report. And uh, we're again targeting these changes to take effect July 1, the same time, again, as our next scheduled fare increase of 2.5% of the window effect on July 1 as well, you acted on that issue. And uh, so again, we just brought this up as a point of information to the board. Can I ask a question? Will, will the capacity of the 524 be the same maximum capacity as the 510? Yes. yes. Well, we're, we're going to, we actually, if I understand your question, we're going to add more seats. Okay. Um, to the, it would be an eight, they're both eight car trains. It's okay. the, that's as large yeah. of a concept as we can run. But we're going to adjust our, because some of our cars are 90 seat cars, some are 110. We're going to look to populate, to, to grow that 524 train, because it will be, uh, it will be the ridership pattern. It's going to be a, a, a well populated train. That, and, and that, you hit the, that was the question. So a year from now or a year from July 1, when we look at the 524 train and we say it's at 72 percent of capacity still, or when it's 80 percent, 80 percent of what, or 80 percent same seat sales? Or how we'll report back on the number of riders, so you can see. I mean, capacity isn't everything. I mean, if you yeah. want a four-car train, you know what's capacity versus yeah. an eight-car train? And then you got to have seats for train. Right, right, right. Okay, thanks. And are there bikes on these? Um, no. There's no bikes. The bikes uh, on the rush hour service are on train 11. A 357 departure and a train 111, which departs at 402. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> I, have, I have double track. Double
sound check. Okay. Uh, just an update on the project um, we talked about Wesley. Um, we are um, well on our way to uh, in right in the middle of our submission to the Federal Transportation Administration for the uh, uh, environmental assessment. Uh, we've gone through one round of comments. Uh, our next round of comments is due May 18th. Yes. May 18th. Uh, and so uh, we'll be submitting our second round to the to the feds. We're on target to um, do two things. One, get a rating by September 1st, and we believe we'll finish the environmental assessment by late September, early October. Those aren't necessarily connected, so uh, it's okay if the EA follows the, the rating process, but we want to keep it as close to that uh, as we possibly can. Uh, we are poised to have public hearings in uh, Miller and in Michigan City in late July is our tentative date right now, but that's, that is tentative because we need to know where we are with the environmental assessment, with how far along that process is. Uh, but we sort of have, we have that as a target or a placeholder to get back out to the public to show them where, how the project has evolved since we first went out and unveiled it last October. And there have been changes uh, made to the project, so uh, we want to make sure the public has an opportunity to review those. Uh, other than that, we progress, uh, uh, we're vigorously working with um, our, our partners on this. I saw South Shore, we're South Shore Freight. Todd, Todd's there, Todd's the president. Todd, stand up. If you got over the board, Todd Bjornstead. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Todd's the new president of South Shore Freight. For those of you who have not met Todd, he's been a great partner. He took Andrew Fox's spot about a year ago now. So you haven't, things are things still all good. It's all good. good. The, the legend of Andrew Fox has been followed. Um, and uh, we're happy to have Todd with us. He's been a great partner to ours. And we've been working closely with South Shore Freight to make sure in the double track project that we, we cannot interfere. Well, naturally, you think when you add more capacity, it's going to have opportunities for the freight operation. That's certainly true in some areas. But there's some pinch points that we have where we need to, to share some of their property that we haven't used in the past. So we have to make sure that that our acquisition of their property doesn't interfere with their ability to service their customers at Arcelor and at Nipsco and, and other um, customers up and down the line. So we've been working side by side with, with South Shore Freight. We've been working with Nipsco, who's our, our, our partner up and down the line. We're making sure that we are sensitive to the National Park Service and the State Park Service as we're neighbors uh, and working with um, uh, historic preservation partners and other uh, stakeholders in the process. So uh, it's an ongoing effort, and uh, we're both still on track to make September 1st with our rating. Chairman, the next thing I want to talk about here, and this this is a, um, I'm going to call this phase two of, of the um, transit-oriented development process. Once, once we move the station to make the gateway station in Hammond, that that'll mean that this facility we have here today, our current Hammond station, is no longer um, the, the primary station. The primary station will be down at, at, at Westlake, the gateway station. And so we'll, we will have this entire, I didn't know that did that, John. Cool. Uh, we'll have that entire uh, parcel that, that we currently occupy today, but, but it's bounded on both sides. It would be bounded by our railroad tracks and the CSX tracks, less than perfect from a development standpoint. So we've had some discussions with with Hammond, with specifically a councilman in Hammond, uh, yeah, Councilman Kelwinski. We talked to the their staff there, and what we told them is, and they support this, they, it was part of their idea as well, and I've talked to Bill Hanna about it as well, is that once we get through with the double track project and with the gateway project, it would make logical sense to uh, bring the tracks our tracks down along the CSX tracks and meet up here, and then we open up this entire area for development. It would be our property that would be underutilized, so we, we would work with our partners, with our, our friends in Hammond, with the RDA, possibly as part of the new House Bill 1144, these transit development districts. We could see this as being a, sort of a phase two um, oopsie, opportunity for for the, the railroad, we asked um, the structure point kind of do a rendering for us as kind of what the vision would be uh, if you were to bend the railroad over. And not only does it open up what, what had been our property as well, 
but it, it really encompasses this area to the north. It pulls it into or further uh, opens up the opportunity for transit-oriented development for this area too. So uh, what, we, what we communicated to, to Hammond was that while it's not currently in our double track or Westlake plans, um, there's a different <coughs> cost factor here and it probably as well is we have to do significantly additional environmental work. Um, but I, what, I, what I advise them is that I would bring this to the board and ask the board, uh, recommend to the board that we put this on our long-term capital project radar screen as something that we would like to do and we would, we would endorse as a board as a, as a future step when the opportunity arose. And so I would, I would request the board to, to, to formally uh, approve um, this kind of a concept plan to give staff guidance to continue to move forward with this kind of an idea. And I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about this uh, project. First president report. Uh, uh, support. Uh, it, will it slow down the train speed? You know, we're, it'll add a couple of curves in here uh, as well, so we'll probably, we'll probably lose about a minute or so uh, of time, so we're very sensitive to that. But we're working in other areas. There's a whole lot of areas that are working on drive train times down. So uh, that's the balancing act here. But I think we need, we, we need to balance those out and say, okay, it's got, if we're gonna do that, the return on investment has to be significant. It's got to be beneficial to both us and to the community at large. And, I could, and, and for this kind of development, if that could occur, I would recommend to the board that we look for ways to uh, make, make up that, that time uh, uh, loss in other areas. Yeah, I would, I'd just add to that, as I mentioned it to the trustee container, that it's, it's great as a concept and the actual practical application when we get to that point may change and may not adversely affect the time or whatever depending on who you know how, how wide it is or what the what the uh, uh, it really like, depends on the curves you know and how steep we have to build to bring the curves the steeper the more you know the, the tighter the curve the slower we go the sure. more you know if we can run it out longer then we can maintain our speed but then that it will cut into your footprint of uh, so there's always a balance it's going to be an engineering um, give and take kind sure. of process between um, what kind of speed reduction you're willing to take versus how much development that results from that loss. Okay, have you heard the president's authorization to execute a local agreement? No, that's it's not it. No, it's not. No, it's just, I'm just asking for a board to give a voice vote and recommend and approve um, staff continue to study this opportunity. Right? Sorry. Consideration. Approve it. Right. Uh, motion to accept the staff's recommendation of the DOD uh, page. Favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, this next piece um, is, is, an, is an interlocal agreement. Um, and um, again, when the board authorized HDR's contract uh, over a year ago in March for $4 million, they did it on their own. There was no, we had nobody else stepping forward, and we did it on a leap of faith. But we did it because. Uh, Bill Hanna said he supported it and he participated from Lake and Porter's standpoint. And we did it because um, the Northern RDA said it's a great project, we're in, we'll pitch in. And we had indications from our friends in LaPorte, Michigan City, that they are in as well. So we went forward, and this is the last piece of it uh, today to um, get the final piece of that four county funding for the double tracking engineering environmental stage. Our council here can maybe comment a little bit about this, but this is an interlocal agreement that allows the Northern RDA to fund their share of the HDR contract. If you've all heard from me on this, and we're trying to get approved well before your next meeting so that we can begin the process of getting reimbursement for funds that have already been spent. The contract itself needs to be massaged a bit because the uh, way it reads, it talks about a project as if it were a construction project. Well, this project is being funded as preliminary engineering. Many things have to be in the contract. Once we get that and the drawdown schedule, I, I don't believe there'd be anything that you would be overly concerned about. And I'm just asking, 
uh, you to consider approving that agreement today, subject, of course, uh, Mike's approval and, and my legal input. And we have heard Mr. Lupin's uh, presentation. Uh, with the of the Motion to authorize the general manager to execute a contract with the and RDA for the uh, final payment of the double track and the engineering cost. We have a motion. Second. Second. Yeah. Any <coughs> question on that motion? All in favor? I opposed. So moved. Yes. Good morning. We have uh, four recommendations to bring forth today. Uh, two competitive bids, one proposal, and one sole source. First item is a replacement aerial bucket truck for the engineering department. Uh, we have a total of eight packets that were requested for the aerial bucket truck, and the result of the three bids. One of the bids was from Aspen Equipment. It was deemed non-responsive. They did not submit any of the certificates. So we have the remaining uh, two bidders, Alltech Industries from Indianapolis, Trans Chicago from Gary, Indiana. Uh, the bids were $496,759 and uh, $205,082. Uh, we also, both bidders submitted similar trade credits of $10,000. So the net lump sum bid amount was $186,759 for the low bidder. All Tech Industries can make our delivery schedule, which will be the first quarter of 2018. Staff recommends that All Tech Industries of Indianapolis and Indiana be awarded the contract for area bucket truck for the amount of $186,759. Staff is requesting the board grant the president the authority to issue a notice to proceed for the aerial bucket truck at his discretion. Okay. Anybody heard the recommendation? Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? Move to approve staff recommendation. Second. Second the seconding question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. The second competitive bid is to replace the Kensington subway uh, bridge at milepost 75.3. The work is to include concrete foundation repairs and a concrete bridge panel replacement. Um, public bid opening was held on Thursday, May 4th. We had four competitive bids from construction companies ranging from Illinois and Indiana. The four bidders were Lorig Construction from Des Plaines, Superior Construction from Portage, Indiana, Illinois Construction <coughs> from Elbert, Illinois, and FH Passion from Chicago. The lowest and most responsive bid for the Kensington bridge replacement is $719,835.90. Lorig's DBE amount is 11%, which equates to $79,182. All the bidders had good participation in the DBE. Nickty's engineering department and our engineer has reviewed the bids and all the technical specs and it is deemed that Lorig Construction is a competent construction contractor. They can meet our district schedule, which is going to be two weekend outages in October of 2017. Staff recommends that Lorig Construction be awarded the contract for the Kensington Subway bridge replacement for the not to exceed amount of $719,835.90. Staff is requesting that the board grant the president the authority to issue a notice for seat for the Kensington Subway Bridge replacement at his discretion. Okay, everybody heard the recommendation. It's a pleasure to announce it. Board. Motion to go with staff recommendation on the Kensington Subway Bridge. Motion to have a second. Second. Uh, questions? I have one. Uh, Superior Construction Board job is 21.2 percent. Uh, what, what, what is the uh, amount that we asked for? Our goal, 9.78. 9.78. And we, do, we update that periodically, and Joe, where's Joe? We just did that, we surveyed, we Joe talked about year. that process. And what the federal law says is that each bidder on a federally funded contract has to make a good faith effort to attain our stated goal, which for the three years beginning this fiscal year is 9.78%. As long as a bidder has made that goal or made a good faith effort to achieve that goal, they are responsive with respect to DBE, regardless of any 
extra, which is which is nice, but they have all attained the law. They've all made the letter of the law. And we, when we do that, we have to survey the market and make sure that when we set the goals, that we don't set them too high or too low. Uh, it's got. We have to make sure that there are deep, sort of enough, enough certified DBE contractors that are well, ready, willing, and able to meet. Um, that's uh, what we do. Meet our needs. That's why we set it and we study it every three years. Yes. Well, I've, I've seen, you know, over the years, I've seen a lot of the 21, 22 percent is a very high yeah. percentage. I would hope that they would, would be a little bitter in the future. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I agree too. On that. I, I, I caught my eye. I was over the. Yeah. And uh, Tony, nothing. I, I'm an <coughs> engineer. Was because of that 22 percent was something that stood out that seemed like it was uh, an underestimate. I mean, it's, it's a savings to us, obviously, but nothing yeah. stood out that, that why they were 22 percent below the next. Yeah, this bridge is is uh, based on unit pricing. So there's a there's a 15 categories that were evaluated because each of the bidders presented those unit pricing, and nothing in that is, is overwhelmingly too low or too high. So the engineer came back and said, even though our estimate was $924,000, it's evident that you got good competitive bids here, and everything in those categories is in line with our estimate also. Yeah. All right. Any other question? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So. Third recommendation is an engineering project for the South Bend Airport realignment. Uh, this was a proposal, so we're following the Brooks method. District's looking to engage an engineering firm to realign the current station at the South Bend Airport. The new route will include a design effort that brings the station on the west end of the airport and a new platform structure. The engineering design will be done in two phases to ensure project acceptance is approved prior to the next portion of the engineering being completed. We had a total of 32 packets and that were requested, which resulted in five proposals. There was an evaluation that the staff has done with six individuals uh, with, compared to a list of predetermined criteria. The five proposers were DLZ, Patrick Engineering, Trans Systems, TY Lynn International, and AECOM. The evaluations resulted in personal interviews with three of the strongest proposers, which were DLZ, Patrick, and Trans Systems. Uh, these interactive interviews resulted in DLZ being deemed the strongest proposer. Nikki continued the process of selecting DLZ and negotiated the scope of work and the price as described by the Brooks Method. An agreeable scope of work and price was reached between DLZ and Nikki, and we have a basis for a successful project. First phase includes complete environmental analysis, 30% design documents, and ready for submission to the FDA prior to the summer of 2018. A detailed scope of services and man hours were negotiated and the first phase represents 1165000 of the total project cost. Phase two, engineering work will require approval from the board for an additional $1,009,526. The second phase of work will produce engineering documents that will allow the district to get competitive bids for construction. DLZ's com commitment for DBE for phase one is 12.7%, which represents $147,995. Staff recommends that DLZ be awarded a contract for the South Bend Airport Realignment Engineering Phase One for a not to exceed amount of $1,165,000. Staff requesting the board grant the president the authority to issue the notice to proceed for the South Bend Re Airport Realignment Engineering Phase One at his discretion. Board has heard the uh, recommendation from the staff. Should DLC not be successful in phase two um, of receiving the bid, would that be uh, a problem with their phase one work that they do, or would that be able to be utilized by another bidding contractor? Should they would should they get the contract <coughs> for phase two? Actually, uh, Trustee Kendra, what we've done here is we went out for both phase one and phase two. So we're recommending that you hire DLZ for the entire process, okay. but we only we only give them a notice to proceed okay. for phase one. Let's get through the process, and then we, once we have the funding done, then we'll give, at that point in time, we'll get an assessment. We'll find out where it is from a cost standpoint, 
uh, because while we have an order of magnitude of what we believe this cost is going to be, that's part of the process here. We want to make sure before we, you know, we're not going to give them the full uh, notice to take it all the way out to final bid dot until we know we're ready to do that. Thank you. So it's a pleasure of the board. We have a motion to accept the staff recommendation to award the contract to DLZ. I have a second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Chairman, I just would like to add for the board as well. Um, we have some good proposers here on this project. There's a lot of interest in this project, but I can tell you that DLZ, I think maybe because it's their hometown uh, and they, it's right in their backyard, they really came with an exceptionally strong proposal. They spent a ton of time, pre uh, uh, time, getting this uh, proposal ready. They invested <coughs> a thousand or more hours already. Into, into the proposal, so they spent a significant amount of time, they know the area, they know that, that one advantage that they have is that they know also not only the area, but they know the uh, leadership in the area, and they know the community, they're six miles away from here, um, and so it, it really does present a nice opportunity. I just wanted to put, uh, here's the sort of the project area, so to uh, get the board uh, who aren't from the St. Joe area uh, accustomed to what we're talking about here, uh, today, we come into the east end of the South Bend Airport and we follow this um, sort of uh, circuitous route, this reverse C, into the airport. It's about three miles. We cross the road 20 times and um, it takes us about 16 minutes to get off the mainline track into the airport. So it's long been the, the desire here to come in, rather than into the east side, that we come into the west side. A number of years ago, we did an environmental analysis, um, and we and we studied a route that would basically have taken us through here and down this way. That was before Lincoln Way was redone, um, and so uh, it's now been widened. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to take a fresh look um, at the project. That star shows where we come into the airport. Oops, come back here. <coughs> And um, we're, we're, we're going to study a number of different options in this general area here to try to get from point A to point B, and point B is back to our mainline track. At the end of the day, we believe that we'll be able to cut off about 12 minutes off of the scheduled time, 10 to 12 minutes off the scheduled time, in and out of the airport. Um, not only will it be a reduction of, of distance, we will have way fewer grade crossings, four to six, depending upon the ultimate um, route that's chosen, and it'll be a direct route uh, in, you know, into, into the airport. So, um, we'll, you know, we talked at the beginning that um, <coughs> we've got double track up and running, we've got Westlake up and running, and now I think with the support that we've seen out in St. Joe County, that, that they're looking to, and I'll leave Trustees Catanzaro uh, and Castelli to talk about the fact that I think there's tremendous enthusiasm out in that area of the world to not only fund double track, but also this is the right time to make the investment in the airport. Yeah, I mean, our goal is to get access to, South, to Chicago in 90 minutes or less. That's the, you know, both the double tracking and this airport re realignment will let it do that. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree, and, and the safety factor alone by reducing the number of at-level grade crossings Went around the Honeywell plant there, uh, the old Bendix plant. Um, it was great when it was uh, envisioned many years ago, three or four decades ago. But um, as we look to reduce the travel time between the South Bend and Chicago, um, this project has received a lot of community support uh, enthusiastically, and I, I think uh, it'll continue to receive support as you as move forward. To look forward to this taking place. Uh, <coughs> I know there was an a event last week with a speaker from. Yeah. 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 And, uh, Vice President Parsons uh, did a presentation to that standing room only crowd at the History Museum of over 100 people in the middle of a Wednesday afternoon. So mm -hmm. couldn't believe it. They charged money too to have him talk, right? Yeah, <laughs> and they actually uh, charged admission to hear Vice President Parsons speak for an hour. They uh, charged uh, double to get out. <laughs> <laughs> so Glenn Housley did a great job, and uh, I, I, didn't, I, I saw a lot of support in the audience and listened to the comments um, from the residents. Very supportive of the South Shore. And just add one thing, you know, for
for the obviously for the residents of South Bend and St. Joe County, it's a benefit to get to Chicago quicker. But it's also a benefit to everybody along the, uh, along the line to get to South Bend Airport quicker. So um, maybe we will then, you know, un, un uh, uh, cork a, uh, a a group of riders that will, you know, uh, increase as a result of being able to get to a, a, a nice destination like South Bend Airport. Uh, I think your comments are spot on. I think there are riders now that are coming from Chesterton, Valparaiso, people that are taking flights to South Bend. Mm -hmm. This will just make it that much more easily accessible. Certainly when we do the double tracking project, we can offer, we're gonna offer more trains. And, and so that'll offer opportunities from the get-go to service the airport. And then we can do things like possibly putting a shuttle train in and a cross-platform transfer in Michigan City and making regular service to the airport. Because one of the limitations we have right now is because we have so few trains that go in there, hitting the time that a plane lands and then getting a South Shore train is hit and miss. But if we increase the frequency of service there because we repay point, that opens it up to the rest of the region. Great. Okay. Uh, double track change orders. Uh, so <coughs> I'm going to let uh, Mr. Nolan speak on this. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Board, um, when we, again, going back to history, when we started this process in, um, March of 2016, um, we, went, we went out alone and we didn't know what the future was bringing from the General Assembly. So, uh, and we, we hoped that our partners in the region would join and fund us. So we went out for RFPs and we had a number of firms and HDR was the firm that came in and I can tell you their original price point to do this project was significantly higher. But we were going as a loan, we didn't know where we'd be, so we significantly tightened the, the project scope and didn't allow for much <coughs> latitude at all. Uh, and so as we progressed through this process, and as the summer evolved and we started to get indications from leadership uh, um, that this was gonna have to receive real opportunity for funding, and when the governor, or uh, both, actually both candidates for governor endorsed the double track project, <coughs> it was Holcomb or whether it had been um, uh, candidate, um, out of sight, out of mind. John Gregg. John, John Gregg. Gregg. Sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, John Gregg. I, I, I lost uh, his name for a minute. But both uh, candidates uh, at the time um, offered support for the project. At that point in time, we knew it was going to be a reality or had a real strong sense. And we then began working with Michigan City to get an agreement with Michigan City um, to allow us to add a second track through downtown, which is, which is going to be fairly disruptive through the middle of the downtown where we're going to wind up acquiring about 62 homes and a number of businesses. And so we then had a lot of changes that we had to do, considerations that, that weren't in that tight little time frame, yet we had the knowledge that we had a really strong chance of making this happen. So uh, we didn't let the limitation of a very tightly narrowed contract stop us from our ultimate goal, which is to get the project to the Federal Transit Administration by September 1st and get us funded. So along the way, we asked them to perform a computer simulation. We asked them to study multiple routes through Michigan City to accommodate their request. We now are gonna build a parking structure in Michigan City that has to be designed that wasn't initially contemplated. Um, the State Historic Preservation Officer has said, I want you to study three times as many properties as we originally envisioned, which means we have to study noise, vibration, impact, visual stuff that was not originally in the initial scope. Um, and so all that being done, um, we are now here before you today, uh, and we're asking for approval to a change order to their scope of contract, which I can tell you is still significantly less in the multiple of million dollars less than their original proposal several years ago, but it's gonna get us to the finish line, to get us to the point where uh, we can submit the contract, or submit the project to the um, FTA on September 1st. So. Uh, I've listed out a number of the, uh, itemized out some of the areas, uh, and I mentioned dealing with South Shore Freight at Bailey. We have gone through probably six different plan, de detailed plan iterations to try to make sure that we don't harm South Shore Freight, and it works with them, and it stays off the National Park Service property to, to make sure that that's done. Every time we do that, uh, it, it's more time, it's more effort, there's more environmental involved. 
So we're asking the board to approve what amounts to about a 29% change order to their original scope. We're very mindful of change orders, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, this would result in about a million dollars or so increase over the project scope of ultimately a $290 million project. Uh, that's about one third of 1% of a total project cost. We still are confident that we will bring this project in at the $290 million level. So I would ask the board uh, support to authorize me to execute this change order. Okay. Everybody heard the president's proposal. What is the pleasure of the board? Motion to approve the change order. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Any question on it? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll go through these quickly, but again, the primary purpose for this slide, as I've indicated in the past, is to really show you what's happening with digital ticket sales. Again, our, our desire here is to get as many people as possible to go to the app or go to the ticket vending machine to buy their ticket. And again, uh, this slowly, on each, on each of these reports I'm giving you, it keeps creeping up. It's getting closer to the 60% realm on, on, on digital ticket sales, which uh, certainly helps, helps Laura and, and Christine and the entire financial department because there's not that back, back end cost for counting cash. Um, also want to let you know, where we stand with respect to ridership. And again, those ticket sales were through, through March. This is ridership and on-time performance through April. Again, um, ridership uh, uh, remained, uh, overall total ridership remained soft at about 2.6% below last year's level. But uh, the one encouraging aspect we have here is that our average weekend ridership is up, which is, uh, I think it's testament to some of the great weather we've had on weekends. It certainly has helped. It's nice having the sun out today. Um, and, uh, and I think as, as we approach the summer, we, uh, we would certainly hope, <coughs> hope to see some of this average off peak begin to, uh, be, begin to go positive for us. Um, On-time performance um, is important. It's important to our customers. It's, it's, it's important to us. It's important uh, to everyone that works on the railroad. And as you can see, the difference between year to date, last year at 82% versus n nearly 90% for all trains. Um, and uh, again, it, it excludes, we had, a, we had an issue with NIPSCO back in, uh, in 2016 in February, and then our January uh, 12th uh, service disruption, uh, th those trains aren't counted either as delays or, they, uh, or that they ran, because obviously they didn't run. But, uh, but again, what we're dealing with now is weekday peak, uh, on-time performance of 94%. Um, average uh, weekday is, is looking uh, great, especially relative to last year. And uh, also weekend ridership, uh, weekend on-time performance is at 85.8%, 79.3% last year. And again, uh, uh, a little over 4,000 trains over that uh, time period. And this just gives you a breakdown in terms of the rush hour. Um, uh, Mr. O'Day just, just loves this number for uh, train 108, getting in at 7.35 in the morning at 98.8%, so roughly 99% of the time it's on time. Yeah, it's really been a spectacular year so far. <laughs> and uh, it's good to see these uh, north of 90% on time performance for the rush hour. Um, uh, um, 114. Um, we'll certainly like to see him get up there. He's the, he's the cleanup train, though, especially out here between Michigan City and Gary. Uh, that's at the last rush hour train. Tends to be a popular train. And we still have, are blessed with some low-level boarding platforms at Ogden Dunes, Miller, that affects its on-time performance. I would go to the board. The the fact that we hit that kind of mark in the winter period, which is normally, if you saw last year, nor normally that's one of, as our worst period. And to be to have a rush hour at 94% coming for the first four months, it's, it's really remarkable. It's a testament to 
some real focus on the crews at part, on the, on the maintenance that we put into the railroad, on the infrastructure. We're focused on trying to maintain on-time performance as well as we can. Great leadership <coughs> on the management side. Our fleet is being maintained extremely well, so we have very few mechanical issues on the trains, and it's showing in our ridership, and um, I'm sorry, in our on-time performance. And again, um, uh, compare that when we have mostly single track that we're running to areas where there's double, triple, or quadruple track, and um, it's a pretty remarkable feat. So I, I just want to comment on that for the board. We're really proud of getting our rush hour in at about 94%. I got one question, Mr. Parsons. Uh, when we introduced the idea of the app, and then we also uh, with the ticket sales, Action on the board and, and the uh, staff to uh, to help people out with the banking industry. How's that? How did that oh. go? Can tell you? Good, good question, uh, Mark. Uh, Laura, you want to give an update to the board? Sure. Um, there is a bank on alliance that is being created, and it will cover all of the four counties. Um, they are making sure that they have all their training for all their. Um, uh, for their banks, and um, it has a financial um, education packet to it also. Um, we hope to sometime mid-May uh, do a little bit more um, advertising on that, that they can go to the Bank On um, website. And Bank On um, hopes to have a rollout package sometime soon to actually announce throughout the four counties. So I've been working with them um, to know when they're actually going to be um, doing that and announcing. They're just still trying to get um, their financial education plan put in place. We had great coverage in Lake and a lot in Porter, not, but it started to trail off as we got into LaPorte and in St. Joe. And so as we talked about with the board, we weren't going to roll out the surcharge until we were sure that this bank on program was available in the four county region. Uh, and so Laura's been working very closely with the Bank On folks. It's their program. And so certainly we'd have liked it to have been done sooner, but I think they're getting, they're, they've made a lot of progress. Right, and it will have like one website for um, all the four counties basically to go on um, to know which banks, um, which branches, um, and also some of their financial planning to help people um, you know, deal with their with their accounts and so forth. So I'm looking really forward to us being part of that rollout and being there when they do it. Well, I can thank you and Mr. Frank, especially uh, David, you were uh, out that getting that thing started. So I appreciate your all your support from our side. It's good that we got involved in something like that. Thank you. Right, the, uh, the last bit of my shtick up here is again to talk about the upcoming events. Um, as, as Mr. O'Day and Mr. Prankus know, uh, this is school field trip month. And uh, we have uh, a lot of school trips planned on our railroad. Um, it, it can, it, it, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun for the kids. It's, uh, um, it can present a challenge for us, and it certainly presents a challenge for some of our regular passengers. But we get through it. They expect it. They know it's coming. Um, and uh, in early June, it will be all over. Um, there, there are obviously a series of events occurring um, between now and our next board meeting. Um, looking forward to uh, Taste of Chicago, July 5th through uh, the 9th, and then on uh, the 7th to the 9th. Last week, in the we ought, to, uh, we ought to attract some, uh, some passengers during that time period for a series of Northerly Island comp uh, concerts this year. So, uh, and I basically identified some of those that I actually know. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, that's Soldier Field. That's not. <laughs> I'm not going to go there and bang my head. Um, <laughs> And then uh, the Cross Town Classic, we all look forward to that. The, uh, the, uh, the games at Wrigley Field are July 24th and 25th. And again, what, what we've done this year also with the help of uh, uh, Group 7 
Uh, we partnered with, um, let me get it up here. There we go. We partnered with the Railcats. Uh, we're helping to sponsor the Railcats this year. And uh, we've, uh, we worked on a joint promo. Um, we're in their, uh, we're in their program. Again, getting fans home since 1908. Again, trying to play off what we did with the Cubs last year. Worked out well. And we're also, uh, uh, we're also going to have our image, uh, South Shoreline, on their uh, big gulp cups at the ballpark. So uh, when somebody's sipping a beer, we'll be looking at the South Shoreline as well. So we're doing this. Uh, we've got a two-year project with them on this. Uh, but again, what's really interesting, I don't know how, how many of you have been to Railcast Stadium. But basically, when you're in the stadium, you see the South Shore go by every game. Yeah. So, uh, you know, again, uh, hopefully we can get the uh, the engineers to to blow the horn as, as, they're, as they're going by those home game events. Uh, we're we're going to home runs here. Yeah. <laughs> can you time that? We well, they put a net up so we can't get any baseballs. There were baseballs laying on the track. Really? Now they put a net up. We're not <laughs> But again, we're, uh, uh, we're, we're looking forward to a busy summer this year and trying to do a lot of <coughs> building trains. Uh, and, and with that, I'll turn it over to Bill and give an operations report. Bill, if you want to talk about what's coming up next week. Yes, good morning. Uh, we have, uh, next week, we have some undercutting work which will begin on the west side of Gary, and that will op that'll be an ongoing project. Important track maintenance that leads to good on-time performance because it addresses issues before they become operating problems. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. That will start actually in earnest. There's some preliminary work already done. We'll start in earnest Saturday with a series of ballast trains. And um, basically, as the week progresses, it's going to be concentrated between uh, after the start, after the morning rush hour, so we do not anticipate any impact to morning rush hour service. Um, and the evening rush hour should also be uh, without any effect. There will be some midday trains, which could uh, uh, we anticipate delays in the 10 to 15 minute range, and that would include 220 and 20. And we've been using our communication tools to reach out to our passengers to inform them of that. Onboard announcements, Gov Delivery website, and, uh, and the like. So we'll continue to, to do that. Train 203 will actually be uh, substituted with a bus starting Monday morning for uh, 10 days. <coughs> And then train 205, which is essentially a very limited used uh, train to Gary, will be uh, annulled for the two-week period. But all other trains will operate. And uh, we anticipate having it wrapped up uh, during Memorial Day. And again, we'll be monitoring it very, very carefully. We don't want to jeopardize uh, what has been so far a good OTP year. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have a resolution. I'm going to introduce Christine Deering, our CFO, to introduce it. And before she does, I know we have some folks from NERPC here. So if you wouldn't stand, stand up and introduce yourselves. <coughs> here from NERPC. They, they, the front row. <laughs> oh, I'm Angie Hayes. I'm the Director of Finance and Administration for NERPC. I'm Lisa Todd, and I'm the Procurement Coordinator with NERPC. I'm James Winters, and I'm the Transit Planner, also with NERPC. Kelly Winger, I'm the Chief of Planning. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The FTA is requiring grantees um, to develop a transit asset management plan. This has to be in place by October 1 of 2018. Um, this plan establishes a tool, basically, for the South Carolina to determine their future capital funding needs, the communication tool between us and, and FTA. Uh, the first phase of this plan is to establish target goals or thresholds uh, for acceptance acceptable conditions of our existing assets. Um, these goals were established with internal staff and focuses on rolling stock, equipment, facilities, and infrastructure. We are asking for your approval and acceptance of these goals so that we can then submit it to NERPC for inclusion in their overall plan. If I may, um, we've talked about this before, but the board has made such investment in this railroad that you always hear the state of good repair. This is what FDA has done. They want, a, they want a baseline understanding of what everybody's state of good repair is so they can measure it. I welcome it because it'll show the hard work and where we are 
as opposed to when you read the stories over in Chicago where CTA's got a $12 billion hole, Metro's got a, or maybe $20 billion hole, Metro's got a $12 billion hole on their state of good repair needs. Um, we're in really good shape, so this is a this is a process that will help really help us demonstrate really the hard work and, and tough choices this board made. They weren't sexy. When you fix the roof, nobody walks down the street and say, "Hey, you got a great new roof." You know, it's not the shiny new toy, but it's the hard work that was done to invest in the infrastructure here, with the bridges and the ballast and the track and the, and the signal systems. We've done that. We're now in position to take the railroad to the next step, and so this is a great process for us. Today. We just heard the resolution 1703 for adopting initial asset management targets. Uh, it was a pleasure. Mr. Chairman, we'll make a motion to approve resolution 1703. Motion. Uh, second. Question and motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. And one last thing, Mr. Chairman. Next week, at, next Thursday at NERPSI's meeting, um, the uh, our TIP plan will be up for uh, approval. And what there's two very, very important things in there, which will be our uh, Westlake project and our double tracking project, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, those are those are very important. It's very important part of the federal process for us to move forward and be able to submit for our ratings. We have to be uh, in the constrained long range plan. And so we're hoping to get really good news next Thursday when NERPC brings it up to their board. Okay, um, the next scheduled meeting is July 28, 2017. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second.